here. My name is Sam. Uh, I need to ask before we play, where are we? Is this Brooklyn or is it Queens? I've got a different answer. This is actually literally Queens. Brooklyn's across the street. Brooklyn's across the street. Okay, that makes a difference to me. When I lived here six years ago, I went to Brooklyn once, and the reason was that it was very scary. Queens, very nice. A nice little place. So if we're in Queens, that to me is good news. Thank you all uh, for coming out. Again, my name is Sam. This is uh, me reading some funny little, funny little stories and stuff, but I want to say a few things before I start reading my funny little stories. And very first of all, I wanted to say a few things about my very good friend Marty Key over here. Um, I, 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 I am, I, okay, I am aware that all of you, and I, I don't mean all of you in this room, I mean all of you in New York City, know who Marty is, and Marty probably could, if he so wanted to, he could run for mayor and become mayor. I want to remind you all that I met Marty in 1993. He was my friend first, respectfully, back off. Marty uh, came to New York in this very weird period uh, about five, six years ago, six, seven years ago, when all my friends from different parts of the country converged on New York. It was a very confusing period for me when suddenly I had all of my uh, California friends hanging out with my New Jersey friends and my New York City friends hanging out with my Virginia friends and my upstate New York friends started hanging out with my New England friends. And in the middle of this big fucking mess for me, emotionally, Marty... <laughs> Uh, a Virginia friend started hanging out with Ted Leo, who is an old New Jersey friend. Uh, Marty started playing in Ted's band. Ted's band went on tour with Pearl Jam. Long story short, <laughs> Marty wound up playing on stage at Madison Square Garden. Now, when I heard this, and I don't, I don't, I actually don't mean this sarcastically. I literally, when I heard this, I was filled with joy. And uh, yeah, I, I, I am being completely genuine. I was overjoyed when I heard this. Marty's gonna play. Madison Square Garden. I was just, oh my god, one of us regular guys made it. We made you, Marty, made it. And I was, ex I was ecstatic. It was like a pre-election, that same high. Like, I can't, one of us guys, Marty King, made it. And then even the next day, uh, stuck in rush hour traffic, I was just like to myself, like, Marty King fucking did it, Marty King. And then, even later, that same day, at my $9 an hour job, I was still like, God, Marty, Marty did it, man. <laughs> Marty Key. And then, even later that day, I was still, I'm going to kill Marty Key. <laughs> now that passed, I'm sorry, jealousy is bad, everything's fine with us, and that's, that's fine, and I'm happy for you, but let's, let's all be honest here for a moment. There are a few, a handful of things, less than a dozen, that we can all legitimately claim on our deathbed as having missed, you know? Say it's many, many, many decades from now, and you're in the hospital, and you are old. And you're still lucid, you're still, you're still talking and communicating, but you haven't, you're not eating anymore, and the machine next to your bed is beeping slower and slower, and you're, you're gonna die. And your family is there, and instead of taking these, these final few moments to be to be vengeful, you know, and, and call out all your enemies, or to be, like, to celebrate your long life, you just get kind of morose, and you're kind of, you're kind of wistful, or, or uh, uh, misty-eyed, uh, and, and you're, uh, I forgot what that word was, and so, your, your family's there, and you're talking to them through parched, cracked lips, and, and you just have regrets, and you say, I, I just wish I'd, I wish I'd seen the pyramids. And I, and I wish I'd written the great American novel, and I wish I'd swung the English Channel and, and played on stage at Madison Square Garden. The thing is, Marty, Marty's been denied saying one of those things. And if Marty, many, 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 many decades from now, surrounded by his great-grandchildren, says, I wish I'd, I wish I'd seen the pyramids and written the great American novel and, and swung the English Channel and played on stage at Madison Square Garden, his great-grandchildren will have no choice but to say, But you did! You did, you silly old man! You did do one of those things, and we got nothing! <laughs> anyway, that's jealousy, and it's over, and I am happy for you. You did it, Marty. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. You did it. That, that was my whole set, so are we cool? <laughs> um, 
The, uh, it is weird for me being at these shows, to be at shows. Uh, this is the eighth show that I have been to in the last four years after the um, band that I was in ended um, quite amicably and peacefully. And uh, one of the, in, in those years, and I'm also counting like I went to go see Van Halen, and I also went to see the Beastie Boys. I don't know how those shows, you know, if I'm counting those, it has, tonight is number eight. Um, and in those four years, uh, since the end of 2004, the, uh, in my mind, I have only embellished all the things that I hated about shows. And uh, one of the big reasons that I was glad to just not go to shows anymore was that there were a lot of drunk people and people uh, seriously messed up on various uh, drugs. So what I'm wondering tonight, because I've embellished this so much in my mind, is are, are, all, are all of you just like totally drunk, just smashed and completely high right now? Yeah. It's a little hard for me to tell, is that yes? Yeah. I mean, I know most of us, like 95% of us are strangers to each other, and, and so maybe this is, you know, weird, but can I just see eyes? Eyes! Okay, all right, no, I'm sorry, that's rude. That's rude and it's a bluff. That was a rude bluff. I have no way of telling. One of the, one of the problems, if you are not a, uh, a drinker or a drug person like me, is that you don't have the ability to tell when people have gotten inebriated. And frequently, like me, you wind up at shows and you're talking to a friend and they're... They're being all jovial, but something's off, and at a certain point you go, are you, dude, are you, are you drunk? And the friend always says, no, no, I'm not drunk. Can I finish my story? And then the next day you always get the message on the voicemail like, hey, Sam, I was really, really fucked up last night, and I am so sorry if I said something to offend you. I don't really remember what happened or, or how I got home. And then, you know, whoa, whoa, what are you going to do? I didn't know, you know. Um, just to be clear about this, uh, disclosure, I have been tipsy a few times, um, and by tipsy, I mean I, I have on, I think, three occasions gone out with friends and had a drink. And when I say had a drink, I mean it's like ladies night out, I get the Midori Sour with a little wedge of a pineapple on the side, and it's uh, amusing, and it's a little weird. I, I just, I don't think that I was drunk, I don't think I was that far along in that progression. Um, the friends that I've been with us, this, this happened three times, they see me the next day, like, dude, we got you drunk! You were drunk! I said, well, I, I, I was tipsy. I really, I don't think that I was actually drunk. And then always, you know, they're belligerent. Like, no, you were drunk, dude. I was fucking there. Yeah, you were drunk. And that's, that's fine. I have, I have nothing. I have absolutely nothing to prove on that point. If that's what they want to believe, then that's cool. And, and according to them, I was drunk, and so be it. But... My thing is like, if that's it, then that is a bummer because that was not really that much fun. Uh, the problem, the problem here is that at a certain age, you lose your capacity to enjoy, to do these things. You know, uh, for me, it's been a, a straight line in terms of causality where um, because, you know, I didn't go out in the woods with the stolen six-pack, or I didn't uh, steal my mom's little baggie of pot. I am now denied from doing those things. I can't do it physically because I don't have the capacity for it. If I were to have one glass, a small glass of red wine, that is the same thing for me physically as getting an epidural at the hospital. <laughs> or if I were to have two of those little green NyQuil pills, that's the same thing for me as if I baked up a big old warm gooey batch of black tar heroin brownies and just ate them all. I can't, I can't do it physically. Like I had a, a root canal two years ago. <laughs> yes, and um, why, why, because of the water? What? Uh, I had a root canal and it was very painful. It, it was a bummer and the, the doctor gave me the stuff, the m m stuff, Vicodin. He gave me Vicodin, and so I was in a lot of pain. I came home and I took it, and I just really, really enjoyed myself. And then that night, before going to bed, I still was really, really enjoying myself. And then I woke up the next morning, and I was really, really just enjoying myself. And the day progressed, and I watched some TV, and I, uh, you know, it came time to go to bed. And I was like, God, I am really, really just enjoying this. Vicodin. Day two rolls around, I get up. It's like, well, maybe I took another pill and I don't remember it because I'm really, really, really enjoying myself. It took six days 
for that pill to clear, my dainty, fragile, little nervous system. Uh, you know, for me, basically, it's been a straight progression from being a sanctimonious, uh, uppity little teenager. I have no tolerance for alcohol to go from that to me being the ultimate lightweight adult. You know, so I know there's no, no wine for me. I, I have no tolerance for, for alcohol. You know, and so that means basically that I'm, I'm stuck here. All of you get to go to crazy time funny land, and I'm just, you know, I'm just here. And the thing that you don't get when you're a kid, I mean, I, I, I kind of feel a little bit the way that I did when I was like a really little kid. I'm like, I'm never going to do any of that stuff. But the thing that you don't realize as a kid, one, is that reality, all of this is God damn boring. It's so boring. And then two, worse than that, it's so long. The human lifespan is so fucking long. I'm only now like kind of at the halfway point. I got, I got another half of this. I still gotta go. And then, you know, God forbid, like 2028, I turn on the holo TV or the medical advancements, humans will live for another hundred years, and I'm fucking stuck here. None of you, I think not a single person in this room is in this like crazy mind prison, I'm just here, you know? I mean, maybe, maybe Alzheimer's, you know? And it's just because I have the friggin' nervous system, or the, the, the liver alcohol processing power now of like a tiny mouse, you know? And it's, it's a bummer. There's been a lot of times, I was at a show, uh, I, at the Silver Lake Lounge in LA, and it was a band I like, Trans Am. They're, they're a really good band, but my fucking God, they were boring on stage. The records are great. And so I'm watching, well, this is, how could this be so boring? And then, and then I just do, 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 look over, oh, and then there's, there's a bar and there's a bunch of alcohol. You know, huh, what do you know about that? And then I look back over, I'm too bored to yawn. And then I look back over, and I'm like, oh, there's a whole bunch of every kind of booze on the man. And then back and very slowly, like, do, 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 like, slowly, you know, that makes this better, you know, like I figured out the equation, but I can't do anything about it, you know, like, great, so what? I don't know if I, you know, oh, you know, I don't know what drink to order, and first of all, bartender's not going to serve you if you don't know, I've, you know, I had to get drinks to other people, I'm like, give me that, and they're like, no, out, it's the same thing as if you're underage, but if I did, say I did figure out a drink to get, you know, I have a gin, and they give it to me. I don't have any insurance because of the way I am physically, because I fucked up and didn't get drunk and high or whatever the hell else when I was younger. I don't know that I won't wind up out in front of the club with my pants around my ankles, seek hiring taxis. I don't have any I don't have any assurance of that. And it kind of it kind of sucks. The thing here, folks, is that uh, pot for me is the ultimate mystery and terror. And there's two reasons for this. One is that all of you people talk about it like it's the greatest thing on earth. And the, all the other stuff, you know, I mean, there's a lot of people, I have friends like, ah, I like drinking, I like getting drunk. But there's nobody who, like, goes through their whole life like that. I mean, like an old sailor bastard, you know, or something. Most people are like, usually, from all of you, I've heard that input, like, I got too fucked up last night, now oh, my kidneys hurt, you know. <laughs> or I've had friends who did all sorts of, had serious major drug problems, and they... None of them have, like, totally favorable things to say about it, you know? They, their lives got fucked up by drugs. They fucked up, and they, and they got fucked up. But nobody says that about pot, ever. You know, the worst of it ever is, man, I just had a kid, and I'm not going to lay off the pot for a while. You know? uh, but it's not, it's, for them, it's just a pause, you know, later. We have the kids in high school, I'll get back to it, but it's not. I just got to be cool about it. And nobody ever, ever, I've never heard... Any of you say, like, pot ruined my life. And I'm not, I'm not stupid, you know? So I know, pot's a lot of fun. But the other thing that makes it so scary is that number two, I have, I have absolutely no frame of reference for it. And the other stuff, I have tasted alcohol, so I, I feel like I kind of understand a little bit of that world. Uh, there was a time in the early 90s when I drank six cups of coffee in one sitting because I didn't know, you know? And so I feel a little bit like I understand maybe what cocaine is like, you know, it's like, I'm not, you know, like the tiny, the shallow end of it, and I've, I've had the painkillers, so I feel maybe like I, I kind of understand that world, but not really, but pot, like, I don't know, it's so far beyond my comprehension, and you people talk about it like it's the ultimate rainbows and unicorns and stuff, and like, that to me is so friggin' scary, and all my questions about pot, uh, to all of you people, I have to 
phrase the same way as when you're a little kid and you have questions about sex and you gotta phrase it the right way so that nobody, so you don't let on how little you know. You know, like maybe you're in third grade and you're talking to the, to the tough kids in fourth grade and one of them's like, I'm getting a blowjob this weekend. And you're like, ah, ha, ha. But then in your mind, like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> blowjob. Why you blow on something? What is it? That's me now as a grown ass man. I don't know. If I talk to a friend on the phone, they're like, I'm like, what's up? And they're like, ah, oh, I just got a big bag of stems and seeds. I gotta be like, yeah, meaning like, that sucks, or awesome. I don't know. <laughs> Furthermore, it's not my job, it's not my goddamn job to know what that means, you know? But I gotta bluff my way through it. And uh, yeah, it's the exact same thing as, as when you're a little kid, because it's the same level of terror. Back then, sex is like the scariest thing you can, you know, like besides monsters or whatever, it's very scary. And pot, now it's like, it's freaking terrifying for me. Because uh, I don't know what would happen you know, that first time. You say to a hypothetical, a hypothetical situation, say, after the show, everything happens, you know, and I'm selling my little magazines out front, and the show's done, and everyone's leaving. And uh, one of you comes up, and you're like, hey, Sam, I, I heard what you had to say about marijuana, and I just, I really think you built this up into something huge, and it's not that big a deal. And also, marijuana is like not even a drug, man. It's like, it's natural, it's an herb, you know? <laughs> And for whatever reason, tonight, you know, maybe because I just had this little preamble, I'm like, you know what, this is it, tonight's the night, I'm, uh, you know, I'm almost 40, I'm going to do it, I'm going to get high, let's go. And so we, we go out to your van, or whatever, <laughs> and you're like, we're like, this is going to be good. And so you, you produce your little baggie, and you've got your crusty the Clown bong, or whatever it is, I don't know, or you roll it up. And you do your thing, you light it up and you spliff up and you toke in or whatever it is. And then you pass it to me. So here's my impression of me doing this thing. I call this impression uh, Sam's first time. This is it. This is my impression. Wow, that's... That's not... Ah! And then there's a title card that says... 20 years later, and it cuts back to me in a straight jacket, and I'm going, ah! And there's a doctor standing next to me, and the doctor's going, we don't, we don't know what happened. Something back in 2009 broke his mind. And there's no one there yet. If only we could find the bastard that did this to him. I don't know that that wouldn't happen, and none of you know that that wouldn't happen, so if you want to take a gamble later on tonight, you can ask, and maybe I'll say yes, but you might have a mess on your hands. The other, uh, the other reason that I stopped, that I stopped going to shows uh, a while back is that I started having a lot of panic attacks at shows, and, uh, and, uh, and yet there's this overlapping sensation of like that's fucking weird and scary. And I don't want to be around any of these people when when all drugs are eventually legalized, or at least marijuana is eventually legalized. I worked at a video store uh, last year, and there was uh, oh, there's, there's that. and so it's like it's like any other video store in America. There's like three monitors, and they're blasting shitty Tom Arnold movies all day, and it's awful. And then one day I come in, and one of my co-workers is playing one of these pro-pot, pro-legalization documentaries. And I realized, I'm listening, I'm doing my work, and I'm listening to it, and I told him, like, right on, man, you know, pot should be legal. Nobody should have to go to jail for it. I agree 100% with what the filmmaker is saying. But when I looked up at the monitor, my instinctual reaction uh, over the top of that was, what is this fucking hippie bullshit? And then two things, I can't reconcile the two things, and then I'm just confused, and I'm wandering the aisles, putting away movies, and I hear a really weird thing over my shoulder. It's the narrator of the movie says, uh, only a madman would, would want to legalize PCP or crack, but, but that one is different, it's natural, it's an herb. And I, think, well, I suddenly get to the left of Mr. Hippie Pothead Filmmaker Guy, I'm not insane. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I don't think that like hard drugs are good. But if you, you know, if you want to 
uh, you know, do PCP with your buddies on a Friday night in the privacy of your own home, that does not equal, like, then you have to go to prison for 35 years and share a small room with a man who killed his family with a, you know, uh, plate or something. That, to me, is just strange. So, the other part of, of what I was getting to earlier before I screwed myself up, and, uh, what? That's it? Okay. That was good. I was getting ribbed there for a second. The other reason why I stopped going to shows four years ago is that I started having panic attacks at shows. And uh, the nice thing about having panic attacks is that you can use the incredible awkwardness and embarrassment of it. And it's like a little jujitsu flip on your buddies. A lot of us have had the experience where friends ask us to see their band. And uh, if they catch you off guard, then you're like, you can't come up with an excuse. You know, if your buddy's like, hey, man. Sexual Awakening is playing Friday night, you come in, and you're like, um, no. and you actually saying anything like, I have to wash my hair, like, what do you say? But if you have panic attacks and the cat's out of the bag, you know, like you're telling roomfuls of strangers about it, then you can say to that person, I would love to come see Sexual Awakening. The thing is, I get panic attacks at shows, and so, you know, if I came to see you guys, I would want to rip all my skin off. <laughs> And then that's it. That shuts the person up completely. <laughs> and it is very convenient. It's, I mean, uh, it's, it is, like I said, it is very embarrassing. Because when you're a kid, you don't grow up to think of yourself as having, like, kind of mental problems, you know? And, um, and also, you, it's the same thing, you know, as before with the pot. Like, you have no frame of reference for it. Like, maybe you watch cartoons, and you hear someone talk about panic attacks, and you think of, like, a cartoon character, like... You know, and it's, that's not it, you know, it's really, it's genuinely fucking awful. And you can't breathe, and your heart's racing, and, and your mind's racing, and you cannot imagine anything worse. And you, you wouldn't wish it on your worst enemies, you know, on which I actually have some. And I would not wish it on them. I would not wish a panic attack on any of my enemies. And you also, yeah, you really can't picture anything that is, that is worse than that situation happening to you right then. But there is something worse than a panic attack called a dissociative panic attack, and I had one once. Uh, and basically what a dissociative panic attack is, is the giant purple zipper of reality goes Whoop! and then you step into a new universe, and everything's different, but it's kind of the same, But and you're basically you've gone insane, but you are still uh, with it enough to realize, like, oh, I am now insane. And so when it happened to me, I was living in Richmond, Virginia, and, uh, you know, I just locked my bike up, and I was taking a walk, and then the zipper comes down, and, um, you know, all the colors are super saturated, and the birds are these, like, hateful, metallic monsters in the trees, and I know, I'm just kind of walking in this wonderland, and I finally get to my house, and I just sit on the steps, and I'm, and I'm looking at everything, and, you know, at that point, you can't, you don't know what's happened, because you really have no frame of reference for that. It's so far beyond a regular panic attack that you have to consider, like, maybe I actually am in, like, an alternate dimension, or, you know, I've entered some, like, sci-fi channel original movie thing, and maybe I won't get to come back. And then I had the additional lucidity to think, why would anyone come to this place of their own free will? I don't understand that. So I know all of you tonight, completely drunk, completely high, I've seen a couple needles hanging out of your arms, you know, God bless. When you figure out an answer for that, you can let me know and send me a postcard or whatever. Uh, it's something that has flummoxed me for quite, quite some time now. I'm going to read some, uh, some crazy short stories I got here. They are all from a small magazine that I have produced and will be selling out there called Claw. Uh, this first one is called... Actually, one other thing about me reading these short stories is uh, if any of you want to... Uh, Take pictures with your cell phone. Uh, normally, I dress up in a shirt and tie when I do these things. It's so fucking cold. I don't even want to change my clothes. And I'm not taking a shower because it's just cold. It's very cold out here, and I'm not going to do it. So, you know, whatever, informal time here in Brooklyn or Queens, wherever we are. But, a little treat for you. When I read these stories, I'm going to have my hood up, and I'm going to hold the mic just like this. And if you take a photo, the right angle, it's going to look like I'm rapid. And then, and then, if you see one of your friends who couldn't make it to the show, and your friend's like, what, what did Sam do? Like, what, what is it? You'd be like, it was fucking crazy. He got up there and freestyled for like an hour. <laughs> and then your friend, and then your friend's like, oh my god, that sounds awful. You say, 
Actually, it was, it was awesome. I don't, I don't, I didn't even know we could rap. It was amazing. And then when it's like two weeks from now and it's four in the morning and I'm sitting in front of my computer in my underwear crying and Googling myself, I'll read what your friend wrote on the blog and I'll be like, ah, and I can go to sleep and get some rest. This first story is called Big Baby Man. <clears throat> Big Baby Man walked into AutoZone just after 2 o'clock. Josh took one look at this guy, 40-something, diaper, cigar, oversized bonnet, and realized he was in for trouble. Darren, the store manager, was out with the flu, and Carol had just left for her lunch break, so this problem was going to be his and his alone. He glanced up to the dusty placard over the front doors and read, The customer is number one. Big Baby Man toddled up to the counter and rested his smoldering stogie in the take-a-penny tray. <laughs> Look outside, Chief, Big Baby Man said. His voice was low and gravelly like a gym teacher. You see my ride? An eight-foot-tall, souped-up baby stroller sat parked in the handicap space directly outside the store entrance, its chrome wheels still spinning and glinting in the afternoon sun. An oversized pair of camo trucktacles dangled from the push bar just above the rear axle. That thing costs more money than you make in a decade, Big Baby Man said. But lately it's been riding like shit, taking bumps bad, getting bad mileage. I'm thinking it's the tire pressure. You have any of those new illuminated digital tire pressure gauges? I, I'm, I'm not sure about those ones, Josh said. Do you want me to check? No, I want to die in flames on the side of the freeway because I couldn't check my PSI at night. Yes, jackass, check! Okay, Josh said as he typed on the registered computer, avoiding eye contact. And I'm going to need a 12-pack of black magic spray on leather care and a new Tweety Bird rubber grip steering wheel cover. Okay. Big baby man took another puff of his cigar. Also, it smells like something died up in there, so... I'm gonna need 40 of those little air freshener car tree things, he said, producing a list from somewhere below Josh's line of sight. Let's see, that's 20 vanilla or coconut, six cherry or strawberry, six berry patch or honeydew melon, and eight new car scent. But you better not give me anything with the word pie in the title, or I'm gonna puke all over again, which is probably what caused the bad smell in the first place. You typing any of this down, big shot? Josh nodded vigorously, still keeping his eyes fixed on the computer screen. Oh yeah. And my diaper doesn't smell so hot either. You got a changing station in this joint? There's this one in the women's room, but I don't know if it's big enough to... Hey! This thing isn't gonna change itself, Einstein. Let's go! You grab some safety pins and talcum powder from my trunk, and I'll meet you in the ladies' room. Chop, chop! Josh looked up. Sir, big baby man met his gaze. Are you and me going to have a problem? <laughs> no, sir. But, well then? Josh looked back down to the keyboard, his face hot. Yes, sir. From behind, someone said, Okay, that'll do. Josh turned and found Darren, the store manager. Darren, I thought you were sick. Darren clasped a hand on his shoulder, saying, Joshua, I'd like you to meet Reginald Powers. He's an independent quality verification expert. He goes to different branches in the AutoZone family and tests their commitment to customer satisfaction. You pass with flying colors, kid, Big Baby Man said. Josh looked from one man to the other in confusion. I did? You remember the golden rule. Darren pointed up, past Big Baby Man's bonnet, to the sign above the entrance. The customer is number one. Good work, Josh. We'll remember this when your next review comes up. Two months later, Josh was standing in line at Target when he heard a familiar, gravelly voice coming from the customer service desk. Look, lady, I don't care what your return policy is. I'm getting my refund for this diaper bag. The hell am I going to do with it? The thing's all poopy! The end. <laughs> Alright, <clears throat> this next piece is called Like My Tattoos. Excuse me, I, I couldn't help noticing you were checking out my tattoos. It's okay, you, you can look. I'm used to getting stares when I go to the, the bank or the supermarket. People get a real kick when they see Donald Duck on my neck, and, and then they see he's flipping off a speed limit sign, and, and they're like, Whoa, I never saw that at Disneyland! That's kind of why I got all these tats in the first place. Like, my body's a huge skin museum. You know? 
charge admission someday, you know? Which, oh, yeah, the, the Calvin one. Yeah, I, I know that looks like the little Calvin guy peeing on someone's diary, but it's supposed to read dairy. I'm lactose intolerant. I probably won't go back to that tattoo artist again. Hey, check this out. You ever seen a stomach like that before? I got six-pack abs tattooed on my abdomen. Smart, huh? And then here I got Celtic barbed wire around each nipple, and then over my heart I got the Chinese symbol for tattoo. That's just me, you know? I like to mix up old school and new school styles. I got this barcode on my elbow a few years ago. It's like, hey, I'm not a product, or am I? You know, I remember this one time, I remember this one time I was standing in line at the supermarket. I was too busy showing my tattoos to the person behind me to realize a scanner must have read my barcode. I got home and read the receipt, and I was like, hey, I didn't buy any milk and magnesia, <laughs> which is ironic because, like I said, I'm lactose intolerant. <laughs> Over here is Robocop and Kurt Cobain wearing sombreros. Yeah, that's totally a space shuttle smoking a joint. That's funny, right? Yeah. I'm just a goofball at heart. You know, some of my friends were even saying I should get the word goofball on my forehead. I was all like, look out, I'll do it! <laughs> Wait, oh, yeah, yeah, that one, yeah, that, uh... That, that does say, uh, nuke Arabs. Yeah, I, I, I got that right after the towers fell. You know, I was, I was pretty angry. And I'd, been, I'd been drinking a lot. Um, when, when the bartender told me that we'd been attacked, you know, I was just like, fuck it, man, ink me up now, you know. But actually, it turned out to be a really good conversation starter at, at parties, you know, and stuff. Some of these are serious, too, you know, like that grilled cheese sandwich over here. That's to commemorate the time that my parents and four brothers were killed in a, a forklift accident. I was actually eating a Reuben when I found out, but I, I didn't trust the artist to get the, the sauerkraut right. And then over here, you see this mushroom cloud skull? Yeah, with the coffins for the eyes? That's to remind me of the time that my fucking girlfriend set the alarm for PM instead of AM, and I had to catch a cab to work because I missed the bus. Hey, you should see my ass. The end. <laughs> This piece is called Extra Income. Extra Income, we can all use a little extra income. Sadly, most folks jump straight for a third job or another helping of credit card debt without even considering the alternatives. There are abundant opportunities to bring in extra cash right under your nose. All you have to do is sniff. Start at home. I'll bet you have lots of appliances you barely even use unless you're planning on roasting a turkey tonight. There's no real reason to have an oven in your kitchen. Pawn shops will pay top dollar for a good oven. And I defy you... It's only one thing a refrigerator can do that a styrofoam cooler filled with ice cannot. Ice, by the way, is a free service offered by every motel in America. Then, there's all that copper piping and wiring just cluttering up your walls. A thin barrier of sheetrock is all that lies between you and this small fortune in scrap metal. I'll bet the guys who built your house or apartment thought they were being real funny when they hid it there. Well, who's laughing now? You, as you drag your copper boodle to the bank. Do you have a Pollock or a de Kooning painting sitting around in your garage? If so, you could sell it for a lot of money. How will you know if you don't look? If you don't have a garage, how are your neighbors living? Would they really miss a Pollock or a de Kooning painting they didn't even know was there in the first place? For the sake of argument, say you find such a painting on what is technically their property. You sell it and you get rich. There's no law saying you can't buy them a nice big box of crawlers and leave it on their doorstep as a secret thank you. Don't be afraid of a little elbow grease. If you have a spare garbage can, write donations on the side and get out in the street with the people. Combine the garbage can with an old tiny handbell and you've got a powerful one-two one -two marketing combo knockout. The handbell can be a powerful tool. Paul Revere used it to great effect. Psychologically, it signals to your audience that you mean business. Try five minutes on a crowded sidewalk, swinging your bell and smacking your garbage can, and just watch the donations roll in. If anyone asks what charity you represent, politely remind them that this is America, not Gestapo Germany, and you don't have to tell them a goddamn thing. Okay, if you have an extra dollar to invest, here is a surefire business opportunity. Buy a pack of gum at the grocery store. When the clerk tries to give you change, yell as loud as you can, I gave you a $100 bill, what? Is this store racist? Then, 
I mean, this part is important in that it absolves you of all legal culpability. Make yourself actually believe that the store is trying to shortchange you. Don't be afraid to turn on the waterworks. Bust out the hand bell if you think it'll help. Whatever it takes to get your money back. Don't worry about the store. They have insurance for these kinds of situations. ka -ching. Next. The end. <laughs> First date tips. Congratulations. You are going on a date. First dates can be a little like emotional buffet tables. In one night you may sample many new feelings. Some scary. Some intoxicating. Some revolting. Here are a few pointers to get you headed down the right path. Number one, protect yourself. Many people only want one thing on a date, your personal information. Beware the date that seems a little too eager to get your bank account and routing number. If a date says something like, hey, let's swap social security information, this could be a trap. Odds are that they have good intentions, but it's best to play it safe. Try to take things slow. Perhaps only give away the first digit to build buzz. Maybe you can make a game out of it. Say something like, hey, Guess which Japanese city and prefix your telephone code my social security number corresponds to. If all else fails, provide a distraction. If you've met at a restaurant, for example, accidentally flinging your meal at the waitress is a good way to change the subject in a jiffy. Number two, always wear clothing. When you arrive for a date and you're naked, that signals to your date that you don't take him seriously. Number three, never talk about Hitler on a first date. This subject may startle or offend your date. Conversely, if your date is not a history buff, you could be forced to waste valuable conversation time explaining who you are talking about. <laughs> Number four, avoid problem phrases. The wrong wording risks making the wrong impression. Try to keep these phrases out of your conversation. Fountain of blood, killing machine, mass sterilization, and I've done unspeakable things. Number five, prepare an exit plan. You wouldn't rob a bank without an escape route, would you? Well, the dating scene is no different. There could be many reasons to push that metaphorical abort button. Marriage talk, unpleasant odors, uh, the discovery of a strange mole. Whatever the reason, it's best to plan ahead. Arrive early to your meeting place and scout out the fire exits and service elevators. Question, is it okay to cry on a first date. You might be surprised to learn that relationship experts are divided on this question. If you've read a particularly moving poem you've written just for the occasion, it may be appropriate to shed a tear or two. But if you feel stirred up by something your date has said, something so magical, something so wonderfully unique and precious that it moves you to childlike wonder at the infinite improbability of your both ever having met in this vast, starry universe, it may be best to quickly excuse yourself and go cry in the restroom. What if your date starts crying? The etiquette on this is clear. Stand up, cross to the other side of the table, and gently cradle your date's head in your arms like a round, hairy baby. <laughs> Quietly murmur, it's okay, everything's going to be fine, we'll never, never be apart again. <laughs> the end. All right, this last piece is doozy, it's called Legs. <clears throat> legs! We in the Hollywood community are always on the lookout for a movie with a good pair of legs. More than the summer blockbuster, the guaranteed sequel, or the massive merchandise tie-in, what we crave is a film that can walk on its own week after week, month after month. A good summer comedy has legs, outlasting action extravaganzas whose box office grosses often plummet after opening weekend. Legs can sprint past any language barrier, jump into any foreign market, and kick any box office slump square in the privates. Gay divorce comedies have strong legs, as proven by last summer's sleeper hit, Till Bruce Dewey Part. Children's romantic comedies have almost the legs of children's apocalypse flicks. If the two subgenres ever merge, we could be talking major legs. Developmentally disabled war hero stories once a staple of Portuguese cinema, have grown powerful legs statewide, and wig films, once a staple of Portuguese cinema, have also grown powerful legs statewide. The joy and mirth of seeing a grown man in a wig transcends all cultures. Hey, do you like movies about chimpanzee drug dealers? So does the rest of America!
those movies have serious legs. Just this summer alone, we'll be seeing Mr. Bingo 2, Road to Chronic, and Captain Dingling Gets Paid. And I'm sure everyone will be happy to hear that Paul Reiser has recently re-enlisted the co-star in Professor Pickles and the Benjamins for Fuck You, Pay Me! <laughs> Audiences want good stories without all the clutter. Clutter is the enemy of legs, and it can take many forms, dialogue, characters, even clothing. <laughs> Direct-to-video is a market with tremendous legs, and the public hunger for nude action films has caught many studios off guard. Warner Home Video has only recently begun reissuing its vast back catalog in the Consenting Adult series. The public wants to see its favorite stars with all their clothing digitally removed. And major studios simply cannot roll these flicks out quick enough. We can well be witnessing the birth of the next talkies. Talk about legs! Thank you very much. Good night.